This video is a smaller snippet of a much, much larger video. In this video, we'll be talking specifically about how bleeding wood psychosis is. But if you want to hear my thoughts regarding a new theory on self-disorder and psychosis, please watch the end of this video for more information. Thank you. I have and experienced psychosis. This puts me in a unique position to analyze the most important game I've ever played, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. In a media world filled to the brim with psychotic villains, this story is different. For it is the one with psychosis that is the hero. And for that, well, I can't express my gratitude enough. In today's video, I won't really go over the gameplay or the visuals or the music. I will a little bit, but not much. No friends, rather I will tell you a story, just as Senua does. To this end, there will be full spoilers for the game, but won't be talking about the ending quite yet. We have a lot to cover. For another quick disclaimer, this video may not be safe for those who experience psychosis themselves, those who have thought about ending their own lives, or those who have been essayed. Viewer discretion is, as always, advised. So join me as we go to challenge the darkness itself. Psychosis is a detachment from reality. This can feature things like hallucinations, often auditory in nature, and delusions, which are fixed false beliefs not supported by evidence. There is a strong genetic factor behind psychosis, but it is also believed to be caused by trauma, especially at an early age. An overabundance of dopamine may also play a part, but we'll be getting to all of that later. But you probably already know most of this. And if this seems like an extremely basic explanation, that's because it is. For this video, rather, I will be offering my own personal interpretation, which is a mix of research I myself have done, as well as my own personal experiences. To note before we start, this is all my understanding of the material, so I may naturally be misunderstanding things. Don't use this information to self-diagnose, as I don't claim to be an authority on the topic, for once. But if you do feel like a lot of this applies to you, perhaps you should talk to your doctor or another trained medical professional. Confusion. Have you ever looked at the world, at your own reality, and not understood it at all? That, to me, is one of the foundations of psychosis. Something like schizophrenia, something you are primed to think about when discussing psychosis, is primarily thought to be, well, a thought disorder. Thought disorder has generally been broken down into two distinct parts. Content thought disorder, or CTD, and formal thought disorder, or FTD. The first, CTD, involves delusions, and refers to the specific contents of the thoughts one may have. This goes down to the essence of the thought, its soul, if you will. Otherwise known as disorganized thinking, it is a common feature in those with schizophrenia but can also appear in other forms of psychosis and even those with obsessive-compulsive disorder. Formal thought disorder is a bit more telling, as while no one can physically be in the mind of another, and those with CTD often have a hard time conveying their thoughts due to things like thought blocking, or in my case, having so many different trains of lateral thoughts happening all at once, something that when I expressed in real time probably scared my girlfriend, FTD is more outwardly obvious. This is the structure of thoughts. And if CTD is the soul of the thought, FTD is the body, its very shape. But this can be broken down even more. Formal thought disorders can be categorized as either positive FTD, which is things like talking really fast or pressure of speech, and more obvious things like clanging or stringing words together that make no sense in terms of substance, but rather feature things like rhyming. The other half of this coin is negative FTD, which is otherwise known as poverty of speech, or having your words have little actual substance, or answering with extremely short replies. A quote from Wikipedia. The amount of speech may be normal, but conveys little information because it is vague, empty, stereotyped, over-concrete, over-abstract, or repetitive. Both content thought disorder and formal thought disorder are intrinsically tied together. And while I won't claim that CTD causes FTD, that would be a gross oversimplification, I do think they both consist of the same essence, one being the body and one being the soul. Honestly, psychosis seems to be the byproduct of making sense of a world that makes zero sense, 
with thought disorder being the actual physical abnormality in the brain. But we'll be getting more into that later. I think Milk Outside a Bag and Milk Outside a Bag of Milk, the sequel to the equally brilliant Milk Inside a Bag and Milk Inside a Bag of Milk, portrays it best. I explained it in this quote when I said, Ending 2. This one confused me, like, a lot. But then I thought back to the other endings I've experienced this far at the time of writing, namely the first, second, and fourth, and thought about what they all have in common. Perspective. It's clear that ending 2 is a closed loop. The girl in the room leads the girl outside and then back to the room, meaning that we are looking at a single person here, but just from two different perspectives. There is the unknown, mysterious entity that does nothing but essentially just make weird noises, and then the normal person observing it. The latter is probably what the girl knows others perceive her as, and in a weird way, the way that she can often perceive herself. During her intense introspection, she may even look at herself as stupid or lesser, just because she doesn't fit societal standards. She may, as we see in the ending, be afraid of herself. It's incredibly sad. And then we have the girl the other is perceiving, the one trapped in the room, screaming for help. And while she clearly lives within a bizarre reality, it's important here that everything makes sense within that bizarre structure. Meaning she has a solid logical understanding of her world, but it's just that her world makes no sense. So to an outsider's point of view, the girl herself simply makes no sense. She's certainly not stupid like we see others believe. This essentially mirrors everything we see in the game, as we are privy to the girl's perspective, both from how others look at her, and how she came to understand her bizarre reality. There are two sides to one girl. In this ending, she runs away from a voice because she's scared. Then she runs towards a voice because she is scared. And that, that is something we can all relate to and understand, no matter who we are. This may seem contradictory, as I just said the world makes no sense to those psychosis. But I would say that the girl in Milk 2, as well as Senua and Hellblade, are presented with a nonsensical world, as they have a nonsensical interpretation of reality due to the many nonsensical thoughts that they have. They are presented with nonsensical facts produced by their very own brain, and their mind then has to make sense of it all. The mind remains logical, but the brain is already presenting false information. Think of AI. It currently works by processing information that is fed to it by human people. If you fed it the wrong information, it would come up with a logical conclusion based on the evidence given. But the information was never correct, so the conclusion will also be incorrect. Now, the human brain is much more complicated, but this analogy I just made up makes me sort of understand my own condition better. So, good on me. It seems rather obvious how delusions play a factor in this. When I shake hands with someone random at the bar as they initiate, my mind immediately goes to, they're going to SA me. Now, it's not even necessarily an abnormal thought, as humans are naturally designed to look after themselves and their loved ones, but then when you have a firm, petrifying belief that for days after the fact, they're going to find a way to come to your house and hurt you, you may have a problem. During a therapy session, I found my own interpretation of delusional thinking. We all have unbased ideas, but they are fleeting. We gloss over them rather easily unless we've had past experiences with the nature of that thought. For those with delusional thinking, however, they take the idea to its natural extreme. They think of the worst possible outcome at all times, especially when they're paranoid, and worse yet, they stick to that belief, firmly having faith that it will happen. Honestly, I still think that man is going to come to my house and it's been almost an entire year. With the help of medication, of course, one can label these thoughts as delusional. But at least in my case, I only do this because I recognize that these thoughts are outside the norm, and that people simply don't believe them. And while that helps distinguish my delusional thoughts from my normal thoughts, I still firmly believe them. The sad reality is, to be candid, that I hardly even have normal thoughts anymore and my world is full of delusion. To get specific, I believe that intimate objects are alive. For a great example, here is another excerpt from my Milk 2 analysis. Enjoy. We simply like things more when they look like us. However, some can take this too far. I'm going to show you the script real quick, and you're going to promise not to laugh at me. See all the parentheses? Those are typos that I kept around because I feel bad for them because I perceived them to be living, possibly even breathing, things. 
I think to myself, they've been waiting all this time for their chance to contribute. I can't take that away from them, so I keep them around. I do this with basically all inanimate objects, from stuffed animals to literal garbage. This morning, I almost ate an entirely burned to a crisp piece of impossible sausage because I felt bad for it. In the end, I managed to only have to take one bite, and indeed, it had the consistency of a rock. It was not a pleasant experience. I had to do everything in my power not to take it out of the garbage and eat it after I had thrown it out. And you can tell me they're not real, and I can tell you I know that, but in my own mind, I'm still going to believe they are. I'm still going to believe they are as will the girl." End quote. While writing this script, I just had to change the word from to for. This caused me great distress, as I can feel the word trembling, scared, crying out for help as I changed it. As I'm writing this very paragraph, I just had to do the exact same thing five exact times, and every time is harder than the last. If I had the ability to cry, I think I would every time. This phenomenon extends to other parts of my life as well. I work as a barista, and every time two cups get stuck together and I have to separate them, I think two things. That one, they just want to be in love and I'm hurting them by the separation, and two, that this is a direct sign from the universe that my girlfriend and I will break up. Well, the first has no name, actually it does, we'll be getting to that. The second is a clear delusion of reference, something featured very heavily within Hellblade. But don't worry, we'll also be getting to that in a future section. I want to give another example. In my sophomore year of college, I had a crouton. But this was no ordinary crouton. No, it was my son. And while everyone begged me to throw it out, I instead secretly kept it, storing it in my mini fridge that was under my bed. I then proceeded to keep it in there the entire school year, to which it eventually molded and spread into the entire inside of the fridge. I wish I still had the picture of it. I'm just now realizing I ruined a poor defenseless mini fridge, and now that will be haunting me until my deathbed. And at the time before my medication, I had no idea that this was delusional. Honestly, it seemed the most normal thing in the world. I didn't realize that anything was even remotely wrong. This is perhaps one of the worst parts of psychosis, and why I cannot stress to you enough how vital and important medication is. Many people don't know they have a problem. It's been reported that a vast number of those with schizophrenia do not realize they even have a problem until they end up in the hospital. I forgot the exact term for it, but hey, I looked it up because I felt it would be left out otherwise, and thus would feel bad. Ano so Anosognosia. I can pronounce words right. It could be potentially dangerous to go without medication if you have psychosis. So if you feel you may have some of its symptoms, please speak to a trained professional. I cannot stress the importance enough. The mind of a psychotic person is a confused one, and that's why hallucinations or delusions are not just isolated cases. The main description of psychosis is a separation from reality. Meaning that when a hallucination, as an example, happens, oftentimes the person will not see it as a hallucination, but as a demon, or God himself talking down a said person. I likened it to dreams. I had a dream last night that my tortoise's shell broke, and while I was terrified, he suddenly turned into a blue cat underneath. And not once did I question it, or wonder where my tortoise was a cat underneath. I completely accepted it at face value without a second thought. This is a lot like psychosis, where delusions or hallucinations seem completely normal. This is why they are so unshakable at times. Alright, I think we've talked about exactly what psychosis is. I hope I was able to give you a very detailed and personal interpretation here that goes past the usual delusions and hallucinations. Now that you have some of this foundational knowledge on the issue, we can finally talk about self-disorder in the game proper. The history of psychosis is vast, and is honestly what I find to be the most interesting aspect of Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. Like, the team clearly did their research on this one. 
Senua's condition, which is undeniably psychotic in nature, is categorized not as a mental illness as it should be, but rather as a curse by the gods, especially by her father. This, as one can assume, has a vast array of historical context behind it. As many religious civilizations thought that things like schizophrenia were spiritual in nature rather than psychiatric. And while this did kind of make sense for more primitive cultures, and is assumedly still bleeding in parts of the world today, not everyone thought this. The Greeks and Egyptians specifically believed psychotic disorders to be rooted in things like the heart, and according to Hippocrates, the four bodily humors. And although their solutions were, well, less than ideal, it was at least a major step in the right direction. Antiquity in particular was a hard time for those with psychosis, as they were believed to be, like in Senua's case, punished by the gods, or simply having been possessed by evil demons. Medieval Europe, though, would be a step in the wrong direction, as while there is some belief that conditions such as schizophrenia are rooted in biological causes, such as diet or stress, institutions labeled as fool towers, better known as insane asylums now, became the norm for treatment. That and graphic warning here, skip like 10 seconds to avoid it, drilling holes in the skull to relieve pressure, or even more genius, release evil spirits. Ouch. Treatment gradually became better though. Philip Pinel, a Frenchman, was a pioneer in mental health care. While procedures before his time were described as inhumane and cruel, he advocated for a more personal approach promoting moral therapy in 1798, which included things like decreasing stressful stimuli and establishing relationship with patients based on trust and understanding. The term dementia praecox was vital in our understanding of schizophrenia specifically, and was coined by German psychiatrist Emil Kreplin. Also, we did connect in this video a little voiceover note here again. Uh, schizophrenia and dementia. So there is some grounds for, you know, it does kind of make sense his basis. Finally, in 1900, Swiss psychiatrist Eugene Bueller coined the term schizophrenia, and our understanding accelerated. Although our treatments would remain pretty primitive until the 1950s, with the groundbreaking development of typical antipsychotics, and then further revolutionized in the 1990s with the advent of atypical antipsychotics. So finally, we are here today with most of the world recognizing what schizophrenia and psychosis really is. That being said, there is still a lot of stigmatization. The very term psychotic is thrown around more than a football, and almost always used in a derogatory way, alluding to a violent or generally terrible person. My only hope is that this video, and thus this game, will help destigmatize the illness, increasing understanding, and furthering research into exactly how psychosis works. Gaming has never looked so real. While I consolidated and mean to keep this section short, I do briefly have to gush over Hellblade's more technical aspects. The graphics for the time are pretty revolutionary, and the second game, yes, this wonderful game has a sequel coming out, looks to be even more graphically enhanced. The way in which the game portrays Senua's detached from reality visually is also astounding. As for gameplay, the majority of the game you will be solving puzzles, those of which we will dive deeper into in a later section of this video. The combat though is still prevalent, and honestly it's pretty fun, challenging as well at times. As for the music, it's also great, very atmospheric. Alright, now on to the important stuff. In some ways, I'm lucky. While my delusions are incredibly strong and unforgiving, my hallucinations are not too bad. I don't hear constant voices like seen in virtually every schizophrenia simulator that command me to do things, but rather I have an internal voice that I call the black text. It still commands me to do things like not take on medication, but it isn't an external auditory hallucination, so I suppose I can't complain too much? Most days I believe this to be an evil demon living inside of my head, a being that I constantly feel his presence in the room. But medication has helped with these symptoms. Senua, on the other hand, hears voices constantly. These voices can often help her and thus you in fights, which is very dangerous. 
to believe in the voices, the lies they tell you. Now, the game never portrays you in this aspect, which I kind of think it should, but it is still not good to trust so dependently in your inner voices. The puzzles in Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice are perhaps one of the more interesting parts of the game and experience. They are a clear example of delusions of reference, as Senua sees patterns in ordinary, everyday things, and finds extreme personal significance in them. I do this, well, all the time, believing the radio is talking to me personally, or having to buy the most overpriced boba tea imaginable just because I thought it was my innate destiny to do so. That was a fun purchase. I can feel it. The darkness. It creeps into my mind more and more every day. I get scared. I think that my brain is diseased, that I wasn't born to be happy. And then I made a movie about it. Shameless plug, I'm working on a feature length film, America Dreamin', so I hope you look forward to it. But in all seriousness, the rot or darkness is said to have a permadeath consequence, meaning if you die too many times, you will lose all your saved data and have to start the game over from scratch. Of course, spoiler alert, really the only big spoiler in the game, the permadeath situation is considered to be a hoax. No such thing will actually happen no matter how many times you die. So why include this besides the desire to add extra tension to each and every encounter? What is the narrative relevance? Well, it seems to me that the purpose of the darkness is because of Senua's father's abuse. He claims she was a rotting mess, that a darkness was slowly taking her over. The game backs this up as the darkness only spreads at certain checkpoints in the game itself, crescendoing into the ending as you experience her journey as she gets closer to Hela and confronts more of her trauma, especially with the Odin trials. Each and every time you die represents a mistake, and from personal experience I can surely say that each of those mistakes builds up. Every fall and step in the journey makes you falter, makes you consider unsavory outcomes and actions. It continues to fester and build until finally we arrive at Hela's altar. The darkness to me is the belief that your brain is diseased, that you are beyond saving. It's a frightful thought, and one that I've had countless times. It is the belief, for Senua anyway, that she is the reason that Dillian died, because her darkness infected everyone. Of course, this is a byproduct of her father's abusive words. I don't really want to talk about the ending for a variety of reasons. I am tired of script writing. I don't really want to spoil the game. And if I make this section short, the script will be 27 pages single spaced. My lucky number. That's most of the reason why. But most of all, kind of. I want you to interpret the ending for yourself, and leave your interpretation in the comments if you so desire. All I will say is, this epic tale comes to an end, in the only way it possibly could. I'll leave it there. I think I used to be happy, once. I used to feel things, maybe not as much as others, but... I remember what joy felt like, even what sadness felt like, but now there's nothing except despair, guilt over my own condition. When I'm with friends now, there is a permanent boredom, and not a regular type of being bored on a do-nothing day, but rather it's physically painful. It feels like life is like a cheese grater and every day takes more and more of my soul off. It's waking up every day knowing what it will bring. That life will be boring and filled with despair every day after the next. And I know this is pessimistic, and I try to look towards the bright things, but there are less of them each and every progressive day. I think the hardest part of living with psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia isn't the hallucinations or the delusions. They are the most dangerous, yes, but what strikes me down the most is this nothingness that is life. I think you either resign yourself to it or go crazy trying to fight it. People can recover. You are more than an illness. 
I know that hope may very well exist, but I'm tired. I think Daniel, a YouTuber who was featured on the Special Books by Special Kids channel, said it best. Do you believe you still possess the ability to be happy? No. I talked to a chocolate milk carton today, which is honestly kind of funny. But I had separated it from its fellow cartons. I could feel it trembling. I could feel its fear. Its screams of pain are still echoing in my head. And I do this every day, so many different times. My therapist tells me to let these thoughts slide off me like Vaseline, but I just can't shake them. Most people, I think, would call me crazy, even in this modern society we live in. But even if I don't believe it at times, I'm still human. I'm just human. There's only a couple pieces of advice I can give you in regards to psychosis. The first and certainly most important is that you have to take your medications. Believe me, I know it can be the most difficult thing on the planet sometimes. Whether that be because of a specific paranoid delusion you are experiencing, or believing you aren't sick and don't need it, or even just the nasty side effects like weight gain. And I know they won't make you feel necessarily better all the time in terms of mood, and it might even in some cases make your mood worse, but just remember this isn't just for you, for your loved ones, and for yourself to stay safe. If there's one thing to take away from this video, ignore the science I explored and focus on this message. Take your meds. Secondly, be open about your mental illness. I know this world isn't quite accepting of it yet, but the only way to make that happen is to openly communicate what it is you're experiencing. I'm not saying you have to be some heroic advocate, but your friends and family deserve to know. In order to help you, they need to know. If you've made it to the end of this video and have seen the longer video, thank you for watching this one. And if you haven't seen that longer video, I would highly suggest you do so. It's more of a scientific paper than anything else, and it goes, it's about an hour long discussion of self disorder, what it is, and my own personal theories on like, the foundations of psychosis. I'll link the video in the description as well as in the end card for you to watch. Thank you. Now a word from our sponsor, Squid Boy, my horror short film. Here is the trailer. God, I really miss saying this. And as always, thank you for watching.